Now it's more, you know, not necessarily as, as safety directly, but indirectly. You know, we don't want to lose stuff. So obviously, we know we we have we have everything tied down, right? So the first, you know, uh, oftentimes you will have uh, deficient clips on the rudder, the little thing on the right. Uh, they're about five dollars to replace, and it takes about thirty seconds if you have the tools. Um, it's super frustrating if the, if the rudder pops out and you have to waste time, you know, chasing kids and then redoing it. Um, I have not really heard about anybody losing a dagger board, but it's a good thing to have it tied down. All right, if they flip and it floats away, you know, now you have to go chase the kid and find the dagger board and all that. So it's always a good idea to have that tied down. Um, Baylor's. I don't think they float, so they're absolutely a must to, to be tied down. And I think one of the biggest things to have done properly is the mass tie down, right? Because that's a few hundred dollars to repair that big repair, right? And if that pops up, uh, and you can see that mass going sideways, you just go, oh crap, right? There goes another one. Uh, as a coach, you look at that, I mean, yes, we want the uh, the kids, you know, to be capable of doing it themselves, but at the beginning introductory level, when you do, you know, the rays and um, the green feeders, it's a good thing to just, you know, check the rig and uh, and make sure that that's attached and everything for you, right? So, I believe that's about it for the for the hull. Um, one thing that will, and this is more of a racing. Now I'm talking brown border again, right? One of the most important adjustments that you can make on the boat is your hiking strap. And a lot of times I see this that you know, a kid buys a boat, you know, from you know Henry who was you know eight, you know sizing out when he was five four, right? And a, and a four foot kid buys that buys that boat and goes sailing, right? It's not going to be set up right. Um, so the hiking strips in the bag under the airbag there is. A line. What I like to do, I like to. That's the eye strap underneath the airbag. I like to go have a loop at the end of the line, go through it, go into the uh, the strap eye, and come back here, and then go back and do half hitches. That makes sense. Um, and it's actually an adjustment that probably needs to be done once a year to the racers. You start the season, literally put them in the boat and go hike. Right, and then you see if they can hike, and the the rail gets up all the way underneath their. Uh, if they if they hike and the knee is somewhere here before the thigh starts, right? There's no way they can hold that, right? So that means that the strap is probably you know too high. So you gotta bring that strap down. So you bring the bring them all in, and what you want to do is you want to have the knee right on the inside of the rail. That makes sense, and then have the thigh go up like that, and get the leg hooked up right here, right the, the foot, right. So, so this is, I think, one thing that you need to do because they will create bad habits. They will start hiking from a different strap or go sideways, you know. So this is uh, this is one important thing. And if you have this all the way to the floor, and they still have the knee over the rail, then they need to buy a laser. All right, right. Like it's, it's it's impossible. It's just you get to a point where you know you just don't fit. So it's time to move on. Um, that's about it for the hull. Boards. There's only the two things. You know, retaining line, retaining clip. Uh, oh yeah, and uh, one of the most frustrating things that you can have too, actually, on the rudder, it's losing the universal. It's very predictable, right? Once they crack, they will still work for maybe a month. Right, so you have a month to order replace it. And the other thing that happens a lot, I don't know for what reason, is when the uh, when the handle, the cushion on the on the tiller extension starts sliding. It's a pain in the body. Right? Uh, if, if that happens on the water, you can literally just use ET. But the problem is it's usually wet. And and even if you do, you know, you have that cushion here, right? Even if you like tape it here. It will probably not adhere well, and it will probably slide off. What I have done a few times in emergency, literally put a couple of rolls of tape under, directly on the uh, on the aluminum extrusion, and then 
shove the thing over it, which creates a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of resistance. And then as they hold it, they basically squeeze it there so, so it does not want to come up, and then still tape it at the end. Uh, if you need to do it as an emergency. And I kind of feel like it's almost better not to have the, uh, the handle than having it moving, because they, they tend to lose it in the tag. And, you know. That's about it for that. Any questions about the altitude? Um, boards, same thing. Sail, obviously that's our biggest challenge, you know, having the sail set up properly. Uh, and we're gonna have the initial setup and then we're gonna have the tuna, right? And the initial setup, I'm a true believer that if you do a straight down setup on the boom and the mast, where you leave a one millimeter gap on the mast, and about five millimeter gap on the boom, you will always be in the good zone. And I had guys who were winning trials, and at that moment there was like, oh, you do the B, you do the C, you know, they would be like doing this one, then two, then three, then four, then three, and two, and one to create kind of like a built-in, you know, loft curve or reverse loft curve, Man, you know. By the time you're done with that, you know, the race is over. I always like just to have a straight down, up and down, one millimeter gap. And the gap needs to be there so that the sail rotates, right? So you're better off having two millimeters than having it slapped against the mat, right? But I think that as long as that gap is uniform and not huge, you're good, you're in a good shape. Um, one thing that I teach, and again, this is, this is the higher, higher level stuff, a lot of times the kids will go out and the sail looks perfect. And by the time the race one is over, the, 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 the sail is all out of shape, right? And the reason being is that the actual A mount tightens up with pressure. So if you have a piece of line, I do have one here. So this is what happens, and, and all the kids, you know, are most of the kids do the same or make the same mistake, right? So you go around, you tie your, you tie your, 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 eight, your square knot, right? And they say, well, it's, it's perfect, it's tight, right? You see that, right? They say, well, it's perfect, it's tight, right? There is no gap. But then they go on the water, and the sail, the wind pulls the sail, and now I have a loose sail tie, right? So. See how that, see what happens. You know, they slap it on. So they slap on the uh, square knot like this, and they're happy, but see all that movement with the pressure, right? Now this is gonna be the final shape of it at the end of the day. But I can create it early in the day. I can do this immediately before I sail up. So what you do, you get, you start extra tight, then you put another cell tie underneath it and pull until you see that knot literally just shrinking until you can't shrink it much more. And then it will stay within that, more or less, without you know, getting in any, any looser anymore, right? And it most typically happens with the... It most typically happens with the diagonal here, right? So they'll go out in the morning, right? And they'll have their measurement band right where it belongs. And it's gonna blow 15 knots and they're gonna put sprit on and eventually this thing is gonna go up and end up here. Um, which has no, there's no bearing to performance or anything, but if you are at an official regatta with measurement, that's the ground for point detection, right? Um, again, probably not very likely to happen at the IOA event. But if you want to set them up for maybe future, you know, like doing it right, if they go to a IODA event or USODA event, uh, that's a good thing to know. Um, five millimeter on the boom, and that's very simple reason. You have the the boom bend fitting, then you have the bridle fittings, right? You want to have enough clearance that the sail comes over, right? And uh, <clears throat> 
I like to do the same, do the five millimeter, stretch it, and then when I have my my bitter ends coming off, I like to tie a out hitch on these around the actual cell tie. Um, if you do that and you do it right the first time, uh, you will firstly not lose them. Because if kids lose the cell ties, the reason why kids lose cell ties is, especially if it's breezy, they sit down, they wait, the cell is laughing, right? And when the cell is laughing, basically, that knot just, you know, just shakes loose, right? And all of a sudden, you have no knot, right? That's, that's what happens. But if I have my square knot, right? And I take the bitter ends and go around and put a half inch here, go around and put a half inch here, I can shake this forever. It will most likely stay the same, right? And uh, it's just a frustration of them looking for spare cell ties. Replacing a boom cell tie in the breeze on the water is a pain in the butt, right? So this will save you a lot of aggravation. Um, and then you can kind of save it and forget it. Right? Oh, one thing that nobody does but me, and I'm a really a real stickler about that too, is the bottom preventer and, and the proper adjustment thereof. Right? That one. Um, firstly, if that is not engaged, your boom bang is rendered useless. And I actually had a kid who ripped his brand new sail in a, in a big gust, because he didn't have the preventer on, but he had a lot of bang on, and then he whipped it around, and basically what happens if you have this pressure up here, so you have a big gust, or you jive, right, and the boom wants to go up, but this is fixed, well, this will go down, right? And I've seen a sail literally rip apart because of that preventer not taking the load and basically the uh, the love cord there's no line in it right it's just it's just basically a hand uh, background so it just blew apart you know so this is a super important uh, super important uh, thing to have first to have right I don't you know for just the basic sailing to have it it's, it's, it's absolutely critical and then you also need to adjust it if you want to be legal right? and want to keep that sail band in between your mass bands, right? And the way I do it, I don't like to have like 17 twists on it. You know, people add twists just to try to, you know, get it. Obviously, I like in between zero, one, or two twists, no more than that. And if I have to have more, that means it's not the lack of twists, it's uh, that this line is actually too long, right? And a lot of booms, and you can see, see them set up, they will they will do, you know how that, there's a hole in the boom, uh, boom snag, they will go, over here and then a tie knot, right? Tie just a, uh, a figure eight knot or, or straight, just a you know, simple knot and just do it underneath both of them, right? The problem is you can't adjust that. And once that boom keeps pressure on it, um, those will be so tight that, that you will not be able to adjust it. So instead of that, what I like to do is go underneath and tie a square knot here, right? And that square knot I can adjust you know, square knots are easy to untie. No, it's not tight square knot, right? If you have a super tight square knot, you just pull on the side like that, and it turns into a slip knot, right? So that's also always easy to just readjust and do it. And what else is there? Auto hole. So most of the bows have this thing at the end. It looks like this, right? At the end of the boom. And then they have a cleat here. So the, it starts here. I would just put a stop knot through the sail, back through here, and into the cleat forward. Right? Does that make sense? Cleat somewhere here. So that's super easy. It looks dumb. Um, that's, that's basically how to rig the sail, right? Let's take a five minute off. No matter what. And. Uh, I think a part of the reason they asked me to do this is because I don't know, remember we had White Bear, we had that inland, it was really blowing. And 
and the, uh, the sales were a disaster and people were sending kids out in inadequate equipment and they asked me to kind of do something like this and explain how to rig so they kind of wanted to elaborate on that. So that's going to be the next part here but then figure through the water, all right? So you can see that. The initial setup here, right? Um, there are some ways of tuning this boat and I think uh, this is super, super important if you, if you get to understand how to do this right. You can, you can save a lot of uh, bad experiences and you can create a lot of good experiences for your sailors. And I think this is the most important part, you know. Frankly, I've been many times on the water fixing somebody else's kids' rigs before the rig because I, I felt bad for the kid. All right, and uh, it's uh, it's one thing, and we want to create the best experience for these kids. But um, because they're so young, because they're so inexperienced, and they frankly, many of them are super scared and, and, and intimidated by the conditions. Um, we need to do stuff that I wouldn't do for, let's say, Henry. Right? Um, Henry, I will tell him, hey, go fix your spray, or go fix your bag, right? At, at the end of his stop already, it's enough, thank you. You know, towards the end of his career, it was like, okay, you're 14, you know, you've been explained this a hundred times, you know, go ahead. But at the beginning, when you, when you grab somebody who's nine, 10 years old, and they're, they're you know, the first time they're gonna sail in the big breeze and all that, it is super important that you not just show them or tell them how to set up the ring, but you actually do it with them. Not necessarily for them, but with them. Or, you know, you, you work together, right? In, you know, in order to do that. And uh, because you're teaching them how to do it by showing them and doing it, uh, but you're also making sure it's done right. And I, I can guarantee you, you can extend the kids' range by three, four, five knots by having the, the, the sail uh, rig properly, right? So, one thing that's I think it's it's underestimated as well is a lot of times it's it's hard on us coaches and uh, you know when they come with the wrong equipment you know again what they tend to do is I'm gonna be selling Lucas's boat because Lucas is five four one eleven one hundred twenty fifteen pounds whatever right so he's got the stiffest spars he's got the stiffest blades he's got the biggest sail available right and somebody will love it. Oh, it would a deal, I can get this boat and all that, and they will give it to a 60 pounder. See, I wouldn't give Lucas's boat to Michael, right? Because he is 70 pounds, right? Or if I would, I would at least exchange the boom uh, for a bendier one, and I would probably, not probably, I would definitely give him a different sail that is cut for his size, right? So most sails will come in three basic ranges, right? You will have J, for example, J Sail is going to have green. J Sail actually has four ranges. They have green, under 80 pounds, blue, 80 to 100, which is their best sail. Then they have the red, which is 100 to about 115, and they have the black, which is 115 to a laser, basically. You know, and I never ever recommend anybody to buy it because buy a laser at that point. So effectively, you have the three ranges, right? You have the under 80, 80 to 100, and 100 plus. Uh, some some sales at four, you know, they try to subdivide it into smaller instances, but it doesn't really matter. You know, it's it's super important that whatever the sale is is in the right right the, the sailor is in the right range. This whole idea, and I've heard it a million times. Oh, I'm going to get my son a bigger sail because it's going to be better in the wind, in the light wind. Well, no, it doesn't work that way. Uh, just because the sail is bigger doesn't mean that the little sail is going to have any major uh, advantages. I would say actually takes the advantages away from the sailor. Because if I can get away with a flatter sail, <clears throat> as a lighter sailor, I'll be pointing higher, period. Because what they do, they just add groove, right? They just, what they do is, you're going to have the light sailor looking like this, you're going to have the medium sailor looking like this, you're going to have the heavy sailor looking like that, right? Slight exaggeration, right? Um, maybe a little further forward, right? Right? Well, this one is has a flatter groove, right? So you can actually come closer to the wind and still be in the groove, right? This one you have to come off a couple of degrees. That one you have to come off even more, right? 
So if the light sailor can go fast with a flat sail, they can go higher. And then I guess this guy out, who has the foot, you know, just to get going, right? That's the always, you hear that frustration. Well, I can't point. The big guys, oh, you know, these little kids, they're just pointing higher. Yeah. Because they have a flat sail. But if I give a kid, little kid, a, a foot, you know, a, a full sail, I'm taking their advantages away, right? So I want to have the appropriate sail. And then, and then I have to adjust the sail properly. So, um, I, I use four ranges and that changes, right? Zero to five equals no wind. And we should not be out there so racing. We can be practicing like today, but we should not be racing, right? For me, five to 10 is light. And that light is when you kind of have to go in the boat, right? When the, when the sailors are in the boat, or maybe getting up on the rail, right? Again, that's going to be different for a 100, 100 pounder versus a 60 pounder, but this is a basic range, right? Then 11 to 15, it's going to be medium. At medium is when you really are firmly on the rail, feet under the, under the uh, straps, shoulders coming out, right? And you start really torquing the boat. And then 15 plus, it's heavy. I'm going to slow that. Right? And that heavy means that, you know, most of your, if not all of your sailors should be straight out hiking, right? And uh, so no wind, it's all about, you know, the rig as soft as possible, right? A little, little looser on the foot, but not much. The, the big foot does not really help you gain any power if it's light and flat, uh, but it inhibits your pointing, right? So in no wind, I would want probably two spins, two to three spins on my preventer, right? The loft should be soft. Literally, you should not have any tension in it, but still straight. You shouldn't have like the huge scallops, right? The foot can have little scallops. Um, then, at that moment, the way I would set it up is let the boom get wherever it gets and just put my hand on top of it and just take the slack so that the vang is, is just enough that the preventer is actually activated, right? But so that the boom does not pop up. Let's say you go through a wake or something, you don't want the boom to be just floppy. But literally just, you know, the line should be nice and soft. Um, at that point, you want spread to be perfect on starboard side. The way with the gaff rig, if you have the, uh, the, the, the sail set up perfect, the spread set up perfect on starboard side, you will tag on the port, it's gonna have a little, like a bow tie wrinkle, wrinkle right here. You know what I'm talking about? Which is what you want. Because if you do it perfect on port, it will be a little too tight on starboard, and then on starboard it's gonna have that wrinkle like this. It really disrupts the flow around the, uh, in the groove. Right, and you have such light air that um, if you have any disruption of that flow, it's, it's not going to be good, right? Um, these are probably the conditions where they have to be good at rounding the mark and reaching forward and setting a little looser for downwind, and then rounding the mark and setting a little tighter for upwind, right? Which should not be a problem. Five to ten, like these are raceable light conditions. I think those are the conditions where. You know, zero to five, they may actually be sitting on their butt and getting legs across just to distribute the weight better, right? Five to 10 is when they start actually getting into semi-racing position, right? So now uh, they should be on their toes, kind of, oops, I don't want to follow, leaning on that rail, leaning on the bulk head, right? On the toes so they can move and they can balance. And maybe towards the high range, you know, getting into like pushing on the rail and getting shoulders over the rail, right? Um, at that moment, I want my, I want my uh, love. Imagine Cunningham. I want, I want it so tight that the Cunningham takes the wrinkles out, but does not yet pull, right? So the same here. So you're gonna have somewhere between one and two twists on your prevention, right? Um, boom bang in this in these conditions. 
the way I'd set it up, I would go upwind trim and normal upwind trim, right? Uh, normal upwind trim would be somewhere here, right? And then just reach forward and take the slag out of the van. Does that make sense? So you have the van with a little tension on it. Uh, so when I ease the sail, you know, it's, it's pretty much fixed there. I uh, lose the leash a little bit on the downwind so it's not opening too much and not spilling too much on the top. Um, and I would probably leave, in these conditions, I would leave the outhaul the way it is, uh, depending on whether it's choppy or not. If it's choppy, I would leave it on definitely a little looser. If, it, if it's flat, you may, you may tighten a little bit, but outhaul is not such a big control on the uh, on the off the then once we start getting and you know sitting on the rail leaning out locking in right um at this point i want my loft to be tight so i'm gonna reduce this to one one turn on the preventer you want to have palpable tension on the on the loft um if you have waves because this is sometimes where chop starts picking up, especially on lanes that have a little more length. Um, I don't want to tighten my outhaul yet, right? If you have a flat lake, like uh, let's say you're sailing Beulah or certain directions in Pewaukee, right? If it's flat, I may start flattening the foot a little bit because you don't need the extra power, right? So the, the, the foot is really, the, the, the outhaul is really the control that reflects the, the sea state the most, right? And at this point, I want the bank to be so that you trim to normal position. Let's just say, let's just say the normal trimming position. If this is the deck, it's somewhere here, right? That would be the boom. So in, in the 10 to 15, I would trim half a distance down, over trim basically, half a distance down, and then put the bang on, right? So it's quite a good tension on it already. Um, Quite a good tension on it as well, um, but it's not maxed out quite yet, right? My sail now still for the heavy sailors who are not overpowered, perfect on starboard. But for the lighter sailors who are starting to get, uh, who are starting to get overpowered, you may actually now stop putting more tension on the spray and allow a little wrinkle to come even on starboard, especially in the gust. So if you have the 10 to 15 range, set up for the low, right? So you want a wrinkle, ripple in the sail in the gust and you want it perfect in the low. Does that make sense? Again, I'm always happier with that spray being on the looser side than, than the tight side. And then heavy air, you're gonna start doing some interesting things, right? And this is where you can really, and heavy, look again, heavy for a 50 pounder star is probably here already, right? So you have to, this This is weight, very much adjusted to weight. Um, now you have to do a few things. Uh, firstly, you take the you take zero on the, on the preventer, okay? So you want to have maximum loft tension, all right? That kind of starts dragging the, uh, the draft of the sail down and away from the top and opening the top, which you want. Okay, you want, you want a super bang, so you're gonna trim to a point where that boom is almost touching the back, right? And this is where the kids may need your help, okay? Um, you're gonna start super banging. But the problem with doing a super bang is that it bends the mast. Permanent, not permanently, but it bends it as long as it's applied, right? The mast is not gonna straighten up. So you, you need to test the day <coughs> if they can get out of irons. So if you put a lot of bang on and you set the kit free and the kit can't get out of the irons, you need to rake forward. And this is counterintuitive. Every boat and everybody who is always teaching you rake back in the breeze, rake back in the breeze. Well, you can do it with the RP. Problem is, right, when you, have, when you have a pretty straightforward rig, right, and your center of the effort is directly above the center of the uh, lateral resistance, right? You're gonna have a neutral boat. But if I bend this thing backwards a few inches, right? And this comes all a little bit here, and you get your center of effort moved just a few inches back, right? Because this mass will bend about seven, seven inches. 
what happens now is if this is the center of lateral resistance, this is the bow, and the center of, uh, so the boat, this is the pivot point that the boat turns around, and the sail is pushing this way, right? It's pushing the bow that way. So you're gonna have a weather helm boat, right? So the boat will naturally turn up one, even flat. Let alone the kids who are light, they can keep it flat, and the more, the more you heal, you dig in the lures, shine in the water, the more the boat wants to head up on top of that, right? So you actually have to create a lured helm boat for them to have any kind of a um, 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 neutral feel. Does that make sense? So you need to start raking forward so now the center of effort comes back forward. Right? Does that make sense? This is very counterintuitive, but it works. The next step that you can do to start to continue depowering is to put a huge wrinkle in a cell by, again, a very counterintuitive thing, ease the spread, right? Um, we go to Lord Del Yorba, there's this beautiful picture of uh, Duncan Lewis for, you know, thank you to you, right? You have an overlook, Duncan. There's years. Duncan Lewis for, went to the world like two, three times, but he was tiny, and he's in the market plot on top of like a six foot breaker, just like, Fully hiking, and he's got the ugliest sail, sail setup in the world because the sail looks like this. You have the spread, and then he had this huge wrinkle right to the to the corner, and this thing was just off, right? Just like that. But he was sailing this half of the sail, which him being 65 pounds and 18 knots of breeze and six foot seas was all the sail he needed. Right? So, um, yeah, so, so the next step to depower is literally break the sail in half, sacrifice the top half of the sail, uh, let it blow, and let them use the bottom one. At this point, if you, if you need to go, you know, this is for sailors who are kind of stepping above their thresholds, right? So if you do this and they're able to finish the race, versus you make a perfect sale, but they're not able to finish the race, it's a huge difference, right? At that point, they're probably not fighting to win that race. But what they're fighting for is, is uh, finishing the race and then building self-esteem and all that. So I think we're helping them, you know? And don't let the parents fix it. Because I've seen parents fix it. Oh, I know you have to put more spread. There is a big rush. Come on, shut up. Right? You have to have the authority to say, look, you know, this is the pro proper setup and this works, and you know, the objective now is not to win this race with a perfect sale, but to finish it with an imperfect sale, because perfect sale will not you know, finish the race for that. And the last resort you can do is also moving the board up about four to six inches. That's about the last thing you can do. At that point, you have to kind of make a decision, is this kid actually capable of doing this? Is this the time to say, hey, you know what, hop in my motorboat, let's observe, you know? And then you continue increasing, you have to continue increasing their threshold and not at the time, right? Just like you wouldn't throw somebody from a little green bunny heel to a black diamond, that's the same thing. You know, you have to go through your promotions, right? So uh, I think knowing these things and then being able to help, especially the little ones, the young ones, the most likely to quit once, right? I think you can accelerate that in their careers. And uh, I think just them having the understanding that these things help me depower, it translates really well in other boats, right? Because if you think about it, if you go in the X boat, um, when, I, when I worked with Chapman a few years ago, um, it was really fast in the breeze, right? I mean, the Pewaukee trials, and we was just sailing away. And uh, one of the main reasons was that he was sailing it as, you know, as tight as he could. Tight out hole, tight cutting end, super tight bang, right? Easing the sail, letting the top of the sail, you know, looser and all that. So these are things that translate into other boats. Uh, understanding that tighter rig allows me to overcome stronger conditions, et cetera, right? So I think this is huge for the kids. I think if you can help them understand that and help them execute that, um, 
You can accelerate, correct? And I know I have it for another hour. Don't you look at the watch. But what we're going to do right now is the last thing for the day. I'm going to walk up to my son's boat and do this hands-on. Okay, so it's talking about the